When you look at, uh, at the moment in, in other applications, in Ukraine, for example, it's helping the Ukrainian forces at the moment target uh, Russian forces pretty effectively. In our new feature, the Innovation Zone, we're going to be looking regularly at artificial intelligence, the technology that's transforming every part of our lives, even if we don't realise it yet. We're going to be bringing you the good, the bad and the ugly of AI. And today... Google's own uh, Google's, Google's owner Alphabet has dropped its promise not to use artificial intelligence to develop weapons and surveillance. The tech company said that it has updated its ethical guidelines around AI and a section pledging not to develop tech that cause or are likely to cause harm has now been removed. And as a reminder from the papers at the start of this show, here's the Daily Star's take on that news. Google nut jobs rewriting code. It's madness. Psychobots with guns. Well, does the Daily Star have a point? Sir Lawrence Friedman is a historian and emeritus professor of war studies at King's College London, and he joins me now. Sir Lawrence, hello. Hi. Thanks very much indeed for being with us. Look, war has often been the impetus for big leaps forward in technology. Could the same be true of AI? Well, I think in this case, the, uh, the technology is leaping forward without war. Uh, but there already are a lot of military applications. This is not a sort of sudden new departure. It reflects uh, a debate that had gone on inside Google some time ago when they were already linked to a big military contract and a lot of employees objected to that and that led to Google backing off. And that was a while ago and now, um, in, in, in effect, it, because AI is everywhere and lots of things are going on, uh, they've come to the conclusion that that particular prohibition on their activities is a bit outdated. Should we think of this then as worrying or inevitable or both? Well, we should also think of it, as with most AI, as being a combination of um, helpful things and bad things. Uh, I mean, obviously, there are risks, and, and the main risk people worry about is with autonomous vehicles, drones, for example. Could we get to the stage where AI takes all the decisions on its own, including uh, w which groups to kill or not to kill? Uh, and that would be worrying. I think that would take humans completely out of the loop. But then you look at... Uh, at the moment in, in other applications in ukraine for example it's helping the ukrainian forces at the moment target uh russian forces pretty effectively it's pretty important in air defenses so you've got a way of working out which missiles coming in at you are likely to hit important targets what which ones may miss and how to direct scarce air defenses resources to them so in those senses it, it, it's, it's making armed forces more efficient hopefully less collateral damage to civilians um so like like most of these sort of developments uh uh, it depends how you use them. By itself, it doesn't mandate any particular way of warfare. Tell me a little bit more about AI, how AI is currently used in warfare. Because like you mentioned, uh, you know, sort of drones being steered, I guess probably sort of rockets and, and, and bombs being steered as well. And also on sort of uh, in, 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 in mapping sensors to figure out what what's attacking and what to target and so on. Are there other applications? Well, I think... The, the basic use of AI is if you've got a large amount of data, it can interrogate it very quickly, far faster than humans can, see patterns and work out what you should worry about. So in that sense, it's, it's relevant uh, to any surveillance activity. Uh, and of course, in China, um, it's used for social control, face recognition. Uh, 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 so you know, the, the whole range from a rather intrusive form of policing to trying to work out uh, if that's a tank or not or on a battlefield, all of these different ways you can be helped by AI. It still will need some interpretation, but you can be, be helped. So it, it's not um, a just sort of niche series of things. Uh, and I think this is one of the points Google made uh, in their announcement. It's uh, it's just part, part of what goes on at the moment, some very mundane, some very big. Um, is it possible to predict what the what the future of warfare with AI is going to look like? Because, I mean, you know, we often get the future of warfare wrong. Before the invasion of Ukraine, you know, people were talking about the end of the tank and then we sort of changed our minds on this. At the moment, we, we I think we expect warfare to in, in, avoid a lot more, involve a lot more unmanned stuff, a lot more drones, and stuff, and it's very easy to see the application of AI there. Are there other things we should be expecting? Well, I think the way to look at it is you have sort of layers of warfare. So it's not that one layer goes away. You've still got infantry, you've still got armoured warfare, you've still got aircraft, um, you've still got smart bombs and so on. All of these things uh, carry on. So you look at Ukraine and you've got trench warfare 
going on and pretty um, brutal World War One types of warfare. What AI can do working with command systems, and it's, it's an aid to decision making more than anything else, is that it can um, link these different activities more effectively. So it's not that there's a you know one definite way of warfare that we can expect in the future. It's going to be interaction between different mm. parts, uh, and what. AI can do, and I don't want to oversell it because it can also, as we all know from trying to use it, make some very basic mistakes, uh, but it can uh, help you uh, use what you've got more efficiently. And I think that's uh, that's largely how it, how it will be used. Uh, I mean, drone warfare, which is the biggest innovation coming out of Ukraine, is likely to be really important mm. because you, instead of using quite large, expensive uh, unmanned vehicles. You're now using cheap and expendable ones, um, and, this, uh, and, and a lot of what they do is surveillance, is, is, is send you observations. Others can be directed to targets, uh, and systems that help you to do that are, are obviously going to be uh, of increasing importance. Finally, um, the fact that most and some of the most powerful AIs seem to be owned by largely tech companies, largely American com uh, tech companies, although that's obviously you know been rocked a little bit lately, does that change a sort of a balance of power that in the past we're used to weapons development? Development, perhaps wrongly, we imagine weapons development being spearheaded by governments and militaries, and now it's in the hands of Silicon Valley. Is that a, is that a departure? Is that something new? Or is that, in fact, have weapons always been in the hands of private developers in this kind of way? Well, there's, there's always been an issue to be so-called merchants of death, and companies like Vickers Armstrong were, were, were blamed for fermenting wars in order to sell their weapons. Um, I think there is a difference now. Uh, one, because a lot of the important technical developments are outside the military rather than the military leading the way. So you have commercial developers whose loyalty is not particularly to, to, to the military. Uh, and secondly, they, they do control it. And perhaps the best, one of the best examples of this inevitably is with Elon Musk and, and his Starlink system, which was vital um, to the Ukrainians uh, just after the full-scale invasion where, when the Russians could turn off um, some of their other communications, but then he started to put limits on it according to his view about how the war should be fought. And I think that is an issue that, that, that is going to be increasingly important because I don't think these are systems that governments themselves mm -hmm. are going to be able to develop uh, because you need the, the, the massive investment to do so. Thank you very much indeed, Sir Lawrence Friedman. And Sir Lawrence is a historian and emeritus professor of war studies at King's College London.